Amen. Good morning, everybody. I do want to encourage you to get your teenagers there and any empty nesters, please consider sponsoring a teenager and just giving an offering donation to our youth ministry. We're in our series on called Rooted in Faith, a study on the book of, of Colossians. And, and before we get into this week's, I need to rewind. Have any of you ever had the Holy Spirit scratch at your heart like your cat or dog at the back door that, and you know you need to do something, you know you did something wrong and you need to correct it? Last week when we were talking about personal convictions and biblical absolutes. I was sharing about different areas and examples, and I was sharing about the defending ourselves, and, and, and I talked about owning a gun, and I made light of a situation I probably shouldn't have made light of. And the, just last Sunday afternoon, I was like, okay, I'll make that right, Lord. Having to take a human life is, is, is nothing to joke about. And so as pastor, I need to apologize for joking about something that's not a joking matter. Does that make sense? And so, yes, I, I have a gun. I will defend my home, but it's not a joking matter. And I kind of made light of it. And so please forgive me. Thank you, Lord. I feel better now. <sighs> Had to get that up. All right. Let's dive into Rooted in Faith Part 5. And we are going to be talking about the lifestyle of our faith. How do we live? What does the Christian lifestyle look like? Not, I think we all know what we're supposed to look like on Sundays, but what do we look like on Tuesdays? And how are we supposed to act on Friday night? And how are we supposed to be with our family on Saturday? And what does it mean to live and to walk this lifestyle of faith out? And so I want to begin reading. We're in chapter 3. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, most of the scriptures are. Sometimes I'll offer another, another translation. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Catch the word since. Since. Since you've been born again, since you have this new life, since you're a believer in Christ, our goal now is to set our sights on the realities of heaven. If you're taking notes this morning, the realities of heaven supersede the circumstances of earth. But so many times we are earth and circumstance motivated and concentrated and, and emphasized that, that we, we get our eyes off of heaven. So, so picture this. The Bible says that the Almighty God is seated on the throne and at his right hand is Jesus Christ. That the Spirit of God lives and indwells on the inside of us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you were transported this morning out of Rock Family Church and you were seated at the right hand of the right hand of Jesus and they pulled up a chair and you sat there, would you question or wonder if you were going to be healed or not? Would you wonder, I don't know, are you really going to answer my prayer? Or when you are seated in heaven and you see the glory of God, you see the magnificence of God and the power of God, wouldn't you view the life that you have from a whole different reality? Of like, well, of course you're going to answer my prayer. Aren't you Jesus, Dad? And they're looking at you and they put their hand on your knee and they're like, of course, son, of course, daughter, we got this. And you're like, yeah. You don't give any thought. You don't give any worry. Because you're now viewing this earth from a heavenly seat and a heavenly perspective. And you're not looking based upon your inabilities or your lack of ability. You're looking at God's ability. You're looking at the unlimited God and the minuscule circumstance. You're looking at the size of your problem compared to the beauty and the glory of a living God. In Philippians 3.20 it says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Our citizenship is in heaven. Another, another scripture says we are ambassadors of Christ. If I'm a U.S. ambassador to a third world country, I don't live in a mud hut with a dirt floor and eat a small handful of rice every 24 hours. I live in a building constructed by the U.S. Embassy that I live on the standards of my homeland, not the land that I'm living. And I eat and I live according to that standard. 
Well, we are ambassadors of heaven. We are representatives. We are foreigners in this land. We are representatives because we're citizens of heaven. We're not of this world. And it's God's desire that we live and walk in the realities of heaven. And 1 John 4, 4, it says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. It's that easy. The spirit who is in you, the spirit of the living God, makes you, causes you to be an overcomer in this life. Now let's go on to verse 2. He continues this train of thought. He says, think about the things of heaven. I want you to close your eyes a moment. Think about heaven. Is there pain? Is there sickness? Is your dog there? I don't know. (laughs) We know cats don't go. (laughs) That's Habakkuk 3.2. If you haven't read that scripture, (laughs) I'm messing with you. I'm messing. Don't make me come back next week and have to apologize, all right? I'm just messing with you. But guess what? There's no pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. There's no more crying. There's no more suffering. There's no more heartache. There's there's no more tragedy. It's victory after victory after victory. So we need to think about the things of heaven and not this earth. For you died to this life, and I love these words, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life, your real identity, the real you is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. Point number two, your real life is having a heavenly focus while living in this natural world. A heavenly mindset, a heavenly focus. Now, some of your relatives might say, oh, you're just one of those Jesus people. You've got your head in the cloud. Yes, I do. It's a heavenly cloud. And yes, I don't live according to this world's standards. I live according to the standards of heaven and what God has for me. Jesus prayed this prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. There's no sick people in heaven. They're just well and healthy people. So it's, it's his will on earth that we are well. It's his will on earth that Tiffany is healed whole and well. It's his will on this earth because it's his will in heaven. He has one will, not one for heaven and one for earth. It's the same. Are you following me? Yes. On your notes, the pattern of our thoughts determines the course of our life. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The the, the way we think determines the way we go. I I used to love playing as a kid and and playing with my own kids when they got older. It's It's a game that is passed on to generations. But have you ever played Battleship? All right? Well, here's the reality. If the world's influence outweighs the influence of God's word, it will sink your Battleship. If you are hearing, reading, listening, following the media, the news, the bad reports, the the stuff of this world, if it is outweighs your time in the Word, your time with God, it's going to outweigh and it will sink you. So we have to counterbalance our life and we have to have the influence and the input of God's Word. The good news. The gospel is called the good news. We have to have more good news than bad news or we're going to believe the bad report. But faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. And when we hear that word, it inspires us, it impacts us, and causes us to grow. Philippians 4, 8 is a powerful scripture. It's it's one of my favorites. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Our mind and our thoughts are going to direct the path of our steps. Now, researchers say that, that we think from the moment we wake up until our brain finally settles down and we go into REM sleep, 
that we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. Am I going to put on my right sock before my left sock? Am I going to brush my teeth or am I going to take a shower first? We are constantly thinking. And when we're taking a shower, we're thinking of everything we need to do. And then we're in the car and we're dropping the kids off and we remember, whoops, turn the car around. We forgot the kids' project. And, you know, your brain is just 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Here's the weird part. Here's the scary part. 90% are a repeat from yesterday. Groundhog Day, remember that movie? (laughs) It's a repeat of yesterday. You say, well, how does that happen? Because there's a pattern that, that happens. Hit me. We develop a thought, and those thoughts lead us to make choices. Those choices cause us to develop behaviors. Those behaviors cause us to have experiences. Those experiences develop emotions within us, and those emotions cause us to have those thoughts, and the cycle just keeps going over and over again. You drive the same way to work, and you get frustrated at the same intersection. For me, it's, it's what is it, powers and, and research? Powers and research. Could we put an overpass there, please? I'll give a dollar to help make it happen. But, it, but it's, it's congested both ways in morning and night. And it's like, just, but do I drive a different way home? Do I? No. I sit there and I have the same thoughts every day. When are they going to have this? And, and the same thoughts equal the same choices and the same behaviors and the same experiences. And I have the same emotions. So here's the reality. If you've ever driven in the mountains or, or on a country uh, through fields and, and country paths and trails, you know how they have the, the ruts in the road. You have to steer hard to get out of the ruts because you start to steer and then you kind of settle back in. You have to steer hard to change the thought patterns of your mind. Look what Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 teaches us. It says, don't copy the behavior, the customs, or the practices of this world, but let God transform you. That word transform is is when you see a caterpillar go to a butterfly. It doesn't even look or resemble. If you saw the two of them, you would say they're not related. Would you not? You would say, this one crawls on the ground, this one flies. They can't be related. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. If you don't like your world, if you don't like your work, if you don't like your marriage, if you don't like your kids, if you don't like life, you need to change the way you think. It's not about changing the circumstance. It's about us changing the way we think. Then, it says, you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Yes. So it's a, it's a mind makeover. So watch this. When I steer hard, go back a slide for me, guys. Go back to the, the, the thoughts. When I radically change my thoughts, it causes me to make different choices. I'm now, because of the thoughts are aligned with the word of God, I don't, I don't make choices based on fear. I make choices based on faith. I, when, when I'm aligned with the word of God, I forgive as Christ forgives. And now I don't make choices as the world does. Ah, I'll get you back. I make choices based upon what the scripture teaches me. And when I make different choices, it causes me to develop different behaviors and habits. And those different behaviors and habits cause me to have different experiences. And those experiences create different emotions and And it becomes a swirly upwards versus a swirly downward. And it takes me higher and it takes me further. Now let's look at verse 5, Colossians 3. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do. Now watch. He's going to get really specific here. He's going to tell us what are the lurking, dark, earthly, sinful things. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality impurity, lust, evil desires. 
Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. It's who you were. But now the time, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. You've stripped it off. Can I, can I put it to you this way? Last Sunday, if you weren't here, I dressed in all white. So this jacket, this black jacket, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Anyways, that movie's coming out. Tom Hanks is doing it. Looks like it's going to be a good movie. We have stripped off our old nature. We take off the old lifestyle. Now, other than when you were a teenager, okay, some of you are guilty, uh, teenager, would you wear clothes that were dirty, right? Teenager, my kids were like, I would walk in, I'm like, what is this? I'm like, have you washed this stuff? Oh, it's good, Dad. It's, it's, you know, it's good. And, 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 and they would wear dirty clothes. We, we put on new every day. I'm hoping that today, the underwear that you're wearing today is not yesterday's underwear. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Some of you didn't say amen, and that scares me. <laughs> but what are we to do? We're to strip off the old nature. Now, on Friday, I was out in the woods cutting, and, and I'm sweaty, and I'm stinky, and I've and I'm got dirt and wood, and, and I'm like, kiss me, baby. Kids like, go shower. <laughs> go shower. Now, I didn't go shower and then put on the same dirty clothes. I removed the dirty clothes from me, and I went, I don't want to wear that anymore. That's the attitude we have to have when we, when we are living the new life and the lifestyle of faith. Point number three on your notes, there should be a clear distinction between the lifestyle of a Christian and an unbeliever. Too many times Christians are, are, are trying to say, hey, 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 I'm still cool. Like, like, I'm still cool. I, I kind of got... No, no, no. Any smell, look or anything of the old lifestyle should be removed from us. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? And then this statement, aren't you living like people of the world? You see, we have to, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. On your notes, we must intentionally turn from behaviors that are contrary to the, our lifestyle of faith. Our lifestyle of faith. You see, this jacket represents my new life in Christ. And too many times, we're, we're, we're trying to be a double standard. I want to look like Christ, but, I, but I, I still want to hang. Monday, Sunday. <laughs> Wednesday, small group. Thursday, you know, no, Wednesday, small group. Thursday, office. And we don't need to be two-faced, but we need to be secure in who we are. And look what it goes on in verse 10, and it tells us, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. How do we put on this new nature? How do we decide that I'm going to be dressed in the armor of light 
and the armor of God. And I'm going to walk in the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. It tells us that as we learn to know our Creator, we will become more like Him. Let's put it this way. You are who your friends are. You are who you hang out with. And sometimes it's easy. People by name would classify themselves a Christian, but by their lifestyle, they don't resemble it because they've not been hanging out with the Creator. The more you hang out with Him, the more He will sharpen you, refine you, develop you, grow you. He is the potter and we are the clay and he molds us into his likeness, into his character and into his image. Point number four, we must daily dress to represent the kingdom of God. We must daily dress to represent him. In 1 John 2, 6, it says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That means we're to go about doing good and healing all manner of sickness. That's what Jesus did. When a woman was was accused and caught in the very act of, of committing adultery and sin, she's pulled from the adulterous bed, and they're going to stone her. Jesus says, come here, sweetheart. I forgive you. Go and sin no more. You see, how do we as a church respond to a, a person who has chosen or, or, or is living a homosexual lifestyle? How do we as the church respond to the LGBT, LMNOP, QRXYZ community? How do we respond to, to how our culture is changing? We're going to love them like Jesus loved that woman. We're not here to judge the world. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. The church is not here to judge. How, how, how do you, are you a Christian or are you not a Christian? We are to judge ourselves. And here's, here's our goal as a church. We bring you to Jesus and we let Jesus be the life-transforming influence in your life. Don't change because I told you. I, 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 I don't change when my wife tells me to change. Now, and she doesn't really change when I tell her. But when we have an internal voice, an internal, you should do this, you should not do that. When there's an internal inspiration, I can tell you, it's a thousand times more effective than an outward, that inward intuition and knowing. Here's our definition of a disciple at Rock Family Church. A disciple of Christ means to live, love, serve, and give like Jesus. That's what it means to have a lifestyle of faith, to live, to love, to serve, and to give like Jesus. Now let's go on and look at verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves. Now he's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to give us what we should be dressed like. We should be dressed with tender-hearted mercy. We should daily be dressed with socks of kindness, with shirts of humility, with pants of gentleness, and, 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 and hats of patience. We should, we should be looking and developing him. God chose you. In the orphanage of the earth, God looked at you and said, I want him. I want her. And you felt like a stray dog. You felt like, no, 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 nobody's ever going to adopt me. And God looked at you in just the way you are, in the mess you were in. Your coat was a mess. You had fleas and ticks and everything else, and nobody wanted you. And God said, I want you. God says, I want you to be my son or daughter. Verse 16 of John 15, you didn't choose me, Jesus said, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Clothing ourselves with the character and the attributes of Christ. And let's look at verse 13. Make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone, everyone, who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. There is a power in this. 
In Mark chapter 11, it actually tells you that when you're praying, if you have an ought or a, or a conflict with somebody, stop, leave your prayer, leave your sacrifice, go and make right with that person because it says if you don't forgive them, your father will neither forgive you of your trespasses. Ow! We are to love and forgive the way God has loved and forgiven us. Now let me show you the power of, of forgiving others. Number one, it honors God. Amen. It honors God. God's saying, you're, that's my boy. That's my girl. You're acting just like dad. You're loving like I. It brings honor and glory to God. Secondly, it protects our heart. You see, so many times we're like, I can't forgive. I won't forgive. I won't forgive. But the quicker we forgive, the greater we protect our heart from further wounding, further damage, and, and keeping us from developing pain and, and anxiety and, and bitterness and wrath. But we let go of it and we say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to hold that offense because it can harm me. Thirdly, it breaks the reproduction cycle. It breaks the reproduction cycle. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, if I am hurt, you did something to hurt me, and I choose not to forgive you, and I harbor that offense, it only continues to re-hurt me and re-harm me, which creates bitterness, which creates the wrong emotion, which creates the wrong thoughts, and then in my angst, in my anger, in my woundedness, hurt people hurt other people. And in my hurt, I start wounding others because I'm hurt and I'm hurting and I want you to know I'm hurting and I just slice, slice reveal, I'm slicing everyone around me. But when I choose to let go, it breaks it from reproducing in me. I read a stat that 35% that were abused as a child become a perpetrator and abuse others. Why would they do that? They're not hitting their child they're hitting their mom. My mom. The anger towards their relative is coming out against their child, an innocent victim. Are you following me? Yeah. Fourthly, it empowers the offender to change. When I understand God's forgiveness, God's love, that he has set me free, that my past is forgiven and removed and shall be remembered no more, when I remember that, it gives me a boldness and a confidence not to be who I was, but to be the new person in Christ that I was created to be. And when we forgive our offenders, it empowers them to change and not repeat that behavior that they have before. In verse 14, our last verse today, it says, Above all else, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Clothe yourselves in love. I like the message translation that puts it this way. And regardless of whatever else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Never be without it. So here's the way I could put it. Put on goodness. Put on forgiveness. Put on kindness. But in Colorado, we can understand this. In Colorado, it's stuck. In Colorado, it's hooked. In Colorado, we understand what a top coat is. And a top coat is, above all else, whatever else we do, we need to put on love. That when we bump into people, they get love. When, when, when we see people in traffic and they're like, ooh, sorry, and they give you that little wave, you're not giving them the single-digit flash wave back. You're like, bless you. <laughs> that we exude the character and the attributes of Christ. That love never fails. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love gives, love serves, love blesses, love forgives, love forgets, love encourages. I love 1 John 4. It says this. This is real love. Here's real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God but if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. 
that we are the expression of God's love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. But how does the world know that? We are the expression of it. And the more we love like God, the more mature we are in our lifestyle of faith. If I could stick a love thermometer in you, it would look like this. No love, cold, bitter, angry. And the more I know God, the more I get to know the Creator, I start to love more like Him. And my spiritual progress goes to the point that I love with reckless abandon. I give, I bless, I forgive, I love others, and I'm burning hot for Christ. Your last point on your notes this morning, the highest expression of love is to love others as God loves us. I want to close with this scripture, 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if you don't love the people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, love those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Let's put on the nature and the attributes of Christ. Close your eyes. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would live and walk by faith this week that we would live in this life according to your lifestyle, your standard, your countenance, and your attributes. Thank you for loving us, God. I pray that we will be light, that our lives will be like a, that city on a hill that everyone looks up and sees. For, for here and us in Colorado Springs, God, I pray that our lives would be like Pike's Peak, that people would see us they would know us and they'd see and hear of our good works and it would cause them to glorify God and to be touched by heaven by our nature and our attributes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we go, I want to make sure that every single person has a relationship with Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, it says, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his son whoever has the son has life and whoever does not have god's son does not have life eternal life with god how do you get it it's by believing in your heart declaring with your mouth that jesus christ is lord you see you have a decision to make i'm going to choose to follow god i'm going to choose to make jesus the lord of my life and 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 by rejecting that or not taking that step, you're saying no to God and you're saying yes to darkness. You see, God didn't create hell for human beings, in my opinion. It was created for Lucifer and one third of the angels that rebelled from heaven. God never created man so he could send him to an eternal hell and damnation. But if people choose to follow Satan and his ways and the ways of this world, that's where they'll go. You'll follow the leader. I choose to make Jesus my leader, and I'm going to follow him home to heaven. If you're here this morning and you've never made that decision for Jesus Christ, if you're watching by the internet and you've never made that decision for Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. I'm going to ask, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand really high. And when your hand goes up, we're going to cheer and celebrate for you and someone will come and pray with you right where you stand. Believers, I hope that you read your notes this morning on that back panel. I've coached you what you need to do every single Sunday and every single service that we gather. Take that home and read it. But are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you living with him like you should? On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand really high. Let's make that new commitment to Christ today. Here we go. One, I just heard this. Well, what if no one else raises their hand? Are you a follower or are you a leader? Does it, does it really mean that somebody else has to raise their hand before I will? Or are you going to stand up for Jesus? He stood up naked on a cross for you and bled and died. Take a stand for him today. Here we go. One, 
two, raise those hands, three, shoot them up really, really high. There's one right there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope the Word of God is changing your life and you're being blessed and ministered to by participating in our services and enjoying the sermons that you see here online. If by chance that you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you take a moment right now and repeat this prayer with me and take that leap of faith and put your trust in God. Pray with me now. Dear loving God, thank you for the gift of your son Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sins. And I invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for saving me and loving me in Jesus' name. And just like that, you're adopted into the family of God. If you live in Colorado Springs or are going to be in the area, we invite you to join us at one of our two campuses. Our Woodman campus is at 4005 Lee Vance Drive. That is at the Woodman and Rangewood intersection. And our South Campus is located at 262 South Academy. Join us at either one of those locations. Check the website for service times. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.